Welcome to the School's Physicist of the Year Awards 2020. Um, my name is Kieran Gibson. I'm the uh, head of the Department of Physics at the University of York, and it's really a great time to be with you, even in these difficult times by the pandemic. Um, this event is about celebrating the hard work and talent of young people across the region, but also an opportunity to thank their families and teachers for the support to enable you to succeed. Um, physics is an exciting subject at the heart of discovering new ways of understanding the universe, but also in helping some, solve some of the biggest problems facing society. But it isn't just this that makes studying physics important and worthwhile. Even if you choose to go on to further study in other subjects, the knowledge and problem solving skills you gain through studying physics will help you in the future. As I said, Normally we would have these events in a face-to-face -face manner, but it's important that we recognize all of the talent that um, we have um, gathered with us today. The awards are part of um, a national scheme run and funded by Ogden Trust, a charitable trust that exists to promote the teaching and learning of physics. It's my pleasure now to introduce Claire Harvey, Chief Executive of the Ogden Trust, to say a few words. Thank you, Kieran. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here tonight and to have the chance to congratulate you all on your awards. As Kieran mentioned, the Ogden Trust uh, supports the teaching and learning of physics, and we work with schools and universities all across the country to try and make sure every young person can have a really excellent opportunity to understand what physics is and how interesting physics can be, whether that's interest in the physics that's relevant to you and understanding the technology that's around you every day, how your utilities work, um, whether that's the big challenges, the climate change, you know, making uh, toilets that work in developing areas, whether that's things that are on the crossover with other subjects um, and the interlinks that come further on in the biophysics and medical physics areas, for example, or whether it's the really wow stuff, the stuff where you get into it and you're just like, but that it doesn't seem to make sense. Why does it happen like that? There's lots of different ways that you can engage with physics and, and bits of physics that you can find interesting. And so it's really fantastic uh, to have so many of you here who've been recognized by your schools and your teachers for your achievements in physics. And I hope you're really proud of it. You know, not everybody gets this. As Kieran mentions, it is a, a nationwide program. And in a normal year, Universities all across the country would be hosting it. This is not a normal year, and unfortunately, not everywhere is able to run the event this year. Um, but you should be really proud to be recognised, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what your teachers and your schools have said about you and all of your achievements. And with that, I'll hand back over to Kieran um, to to start telling us what you've all been doing. Thanks, Claire. So just to remind you a little bit about these awards, the awards are for students in years 10 and 12, those completing the first year of their GCSE course and those completing the first year of their A-level course. Each student will receive a certificate and a £25 book token. Um, normally, I'd be welcoming you on, all individually onto a stage and shaking your hand and taking pictures of that. Instead, we're going to send those through the post. Um, Depending upon the size of the year group, schools in the region are eligible to nominate one, two, or even three students for the biggest schools and colleges. Um, for each, each student, the nominating teacher has given a brief commendation, which I'll read out as I go through the lists. So to begin with year 10, and to start with All Saints RC School in York, um, for both Imogen and Robert, excellent effort and achievement in physics throughout year 10. From Ampleforth College, Kimmy. Kimmy's an outstanding student who produces high quality work in physics. She's been nominated based on her consistently excellent work and for the example she sets to her fellow students. From Ampleforth College as well, Nicholas. Nicholas has an excellent approach to his physics work. He continually asks questions, always tries to find out more and looks to apply what he's learned to more complex situations. He's exactly the right mindset to be a physicist. And now from Bedlington Academy, Jake. Jake has shown absolute dedication to his studies over the last two years and is a very gifted young man. He constantly strives to be better, asks insightful questions, and is very interested in areas outside of the curriculum. Alice from Bootham School. Alice is a bright and able year 10 physics student. 
She's exceeding expectations in terms of working hard and understanding every concept we cover in class. She has the admirable quality of asking searching questions, ensuring that no explanations go unchallenged. From Fulford School, Baz, he is an excellent student and an inspiration to others. And also at Fulford, Maria. Maria is a charming young lady who supports those around her, as well as performing consistently highly in her class. From Garforth Academy, Isla. Isla has an amazing aptitude for physics and commits 100% to the subject. She works at problems and is able to think her way through practical investigations to all, always achieve her goal for the activity. Also at Garforth, Thomas. Thomas is a motivated individual that really commits to his physics studies. He's able to absorb and apply theories to a wide variety of situations. From Keswick School, Andrew. Sustained high performance throughout <clears throat> year 10 in all tests, asking and answering questions which demonstrate his interest in the subject and the depth of his knowledge and understanding. Also from Keswick, Niha Naimi, outstanding performance in module tests in year 10 and demonstration of an excellent understanding of the content covered. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and now from Malton School, Ella. Ella's always pushed herself and those around her to work in the top of their abilities in physics. She doesn't shy away from challenges and difficult concepts, which she approaches confidently and with great insight. Rohan from Malton School has worked incredibly hard this year and always takes an active role in class discussion. He's demonstrated lots of insightful ideas and questions about and around the topics we've covered this year. The Manor C of E Academy, Benjamin, has a restless curiosity and interest in physics, outstanding achievements throughout the year, being brave to push himself into new challenges. Ruby, also from Manor C of E Academy, is consistently achieving high, highly achieving in physics with an excellent attitude to learning and a natural aptitude and an inquiry mind. From Ripon Grammar School, Scarlett has continued to work extremely hard in physics despite not having an easy year. Her recent project in astronomy was an example of the very high standard of work that she's produced this year. It was easily of A-level standard. Jesse from Scarborough College is an excellent student of physics and has achieved the highest overall test score out of a year group throughout this academic year. Add this to a natural inquisitiveness, a thirst for knowledge, and it becomes clear why she's been nominated for this award. Hannah from Selby High School. In addition to having excellent performance, Hannah has been incredibly hardworking and conscientious. And similarly, Nicholas has had the similar approach, both combining academic excellence and hard work. From St. Aidan's Church of England School, Abigail is an outstanding physics. She puts 100% effort into every lesson and approaches every day with a smile. Her work ethic is, is extraordinary and she consistently impresses her science teachers. Abigail's a delightful student who thoroughly deserves this award. Well done, Abigail. You're going to make a fantastic A-level physicist. Also from St. Aidan's, Rohan. Rohan is exceptionally keen and talented physics who is always asking thoughtful questions, is always a polite and present student who is more than happy to help other students in class. I've no doubt that Rohan is going to exceed to ex going to excel at A-level physics, and it's been a real pleasure to teach him so far. From St. John Fisher Catholic High School, Marte, always working hard, showing a real interest in physics and keeping teachers on their toes with fascinating and complex questions on particle physics during lockdown. Martha from St. Peter's School in York has been a consistently outstanding student and she achieved a superb score in the Olympiad Year 10 Challenge. Also at St. Peter's, um, Thomas. Tom is a consistently top of the class and is very able and he shows a great enthusiasm for his subject. From the Brookbank School, Cyrus. Cyrus has an ability to naturally see what is happening and use his scientific understanding to explain it to others in a clear and concise way. He uses his transferable skills to solve complex problems in a logical manner. Also from the Brooks Bank School, Martha is hardworking and articulate. She's an excellent understanding of physics and can use prior knowledge to help her solve problems. She's an eye for detail that means she spots relevant information and applies her mathematical abilities to solve complex multi-stage calculation questions. Batul from the Joseph Rowntree School has shown enthusiasm for physics and has made a tremendous effort this year overcoming difficulties all the way. 
Jake from the King's Academy, again, outstanding work within physics, and Mary, who's also at the King's Academy, has done outstanding work within lessons and shows great promise in the field of physics. From the Mount School, Franca has been nominated due to her excellent attitude and outcomes in physics. Her strengths in physics are the independence and resilience she demonstrates in and out of the classroom. She's attentive in lessons, quietly absorbing new information, and excels it in applying it to unfamiliar and challenging problems. From York High School, Emma. Emma is determined to succeed. She never gives up, never stops trying, and always gets there in the end. If there's no better trait in a physicist than this, then she has the potential to study physics at a very high level. Her teacher is very proud of her. Oscar, also from York High School, with an inquisitive mind, a thirst for knowledge, and a determination to understand all of life's problems, Oscar is a superb student and has the potential to go on and become a phenomenal scientist. His teacher is very proud of him and the way he challenges his teacher's thinking every day. So well done to all of those year 10 um, winners of the award this year. Turning now to year 12 awards, from All Saints um, RC School, Sam has displayed consistently excellent effort and achievement in year 12 physics. Rupert from Ampleforth College is a dedicated student and one who's flourishing at A-level. He is inquisitive in his approach and very thorough in his work. He's currently pushing his own knowledge of physics and mechanics beyond A-level with his EPQ on future bridge designs. John from Archbishop Holgate School has worked tirelessly and tenaciously to understand and master the key concepts in his course. He's also kindly and patiently shared his understanding with others, helping them to grasp the same topics that he's worked on. A true team player. Maya, also from Archbishop Holgate School, loves to work things out and ask those probing questions about why we observe what we do in the universe. She enjoys and rises to the challenges that physics throws at us and pursues answers with openness and honesty. Laura from Bedlington Academy is a very intelligent young lady who I know will go on to be very successful in her chosen field. Laura is dedicated to her studies and always strives to be the best she can be. She works extremely hard and is interested in the wider context of physics rather than simply focusing on the taught material. She asks questions to further her understanding and supports students in class when they need it. She's an absolute pleasure to teach and thoroughly deserves this award. Sophia from Botham School is a key member of our astronomy GCSE group. She's demonstrated for the York Festival Ideas astronomy events in June 2019 and would have done so again this year if, if we weren't in the lockdown. She made good observations of the solar eclipse from Argentina last year and intends to study astrophysics at university. From Fulford School, Annie is an amazing and humble scientist who excels at every piece of work she, done, she does. She's a pleasure to teach and is passionate about physics. From Gar Garforth Academy, Ewan is a strong physics candidate that shows a very keen interest in the subject. He shows a really logical way of thinking about problems and is very good at adapting his approach to work through complex theories and problems. Joseph from Keswick School has had outstanding attainment throughout year 12, an excellent work ethic and a very conscientious student. In the classroom, Joe always has time to help his peers who may be struggling lessons and has shown a strong understanding of all content covered. From Moulton School, um, Emily. Since joining Moulton School at the start of year 12, Emily has worked extremely hard at physics and achieved excellent results. She pus pushes herself hard to complete work early and doesn't hesitate to ask questions and explore topics she's curious about. Amy from Ripon Grammar School shows a dedication and commitment to her studies that never falters, even when the concepts get more complex. She gives of her time to mentor other students and is a role model to the rest of the boarders. Ping An from Scarborough College is an exceptionally well-rounded student of physics. From her high test scores to her natural curiosity to the phenomenal level of effort that she displays in her study of the subject, as well as her choice to research a physics topic for her extended essay. Ping An well deserves to receive this award. St. Aidan's Church of England School, High School has George. It's been a pleasure to teach George for the past year, says his teacher. He approaches every lesson with a fantastic attitude and an inquisitive mind. His work ethic is fantastic 
and he's an outstanding physicist. I have no doubt in my mind that he will excel in physics at university. Well done on an excellent year, George. Isabella from St. Aidan's Church of England High School is an absolutely delightful student who's an outstanding phys physicist. She's always willing to throw herself into all physics opportunities, including studies for a GCSE in astronomy in her spare time. Isabella is fantastically bright as well as hardworking, and these attributes have allowed her to excel during the physics A-level. She should definitely study physics at university. From St. John Catholic, St. John Fisher Catholic High School in Harrogate, Libby, Libby shares uh, sharing her enthusiasm for physics by contributing her time and energy to help organize and run a space club attended by younger students. From St. Peter's School, Kevin has a genuine thirst for knowledge and the acquisition of skills, and he has been an absolute delight to teach. There's always a big grin when he masters the most difficult Isaac physics questions, and this has been rewarded with a place on the Cambridge SPC Masterclass. Miles from the Brooks Bank School is a talented physicist and backs up his ability with hard work. He quickly absorbs difficult concepts and then applies them to easily solve complex problems. Sam from the Joseph Browntree School has shown enthusiasm for the physics course from day one. Even now in lockdown, he's working hard and helping his teacher out with the remote learning technology. So not just physics, but, but also helping us through these difficult times. From the King's Academy, Adam, Adam, his teacher comments how on his outstanding progress so far within both GCSE and A-level physics. Also from the King's Academy, Grace. Grace has shown incredible resilience during her physics study so far. Her determination to succeed is admirable. She's a bright future ahead of her. From the Mount School in York, Sophie has demonstrated excellent independence and resilience in physics this year. She relishes the opportunity to challenge herself to overcome thought-provoking tasks with minimal support, often refusing help unless necessary. Sophie enjoys the outcome of overcoming these challenges and is developing an important mindset for the future. From Wyke Sixth Form College, Emily was nominated for this award because of her consistently high attainment and her determination throughout the year in physics. She demonstrated infectious amounts of enthusiasm and is an effective team leader in group work. Emily participated in many of the extracurricular events that the department offered, including the Science Live event at the University of Manchester and the Physics Olympiad. She's also entered the Newnham College Essay Prize in engineering early this year, as well as completing a future loan course on the ABCs of Flight Mechanics Online. Also from Wyke Sixth Form College, Kiram was nominated for this award because of his consistently high attainment and his determination throughout the year. He has work experience in the astrophysics department at the University of Hull, using Linux and Python to help investigate metallicity. He visited CERN in 2019 and in 2020 participated in Isaac Physics online masterclasses on circuits. He engages in lots of background re reading, most re recently the character of physical law by Feynman and gained bronze in this year's Physics Olympiad. This summer he'll be working towards a gold crest award with Dr. Marco Pignateri. From your college, Ben has shown an unstinting and energetic enthusiasm for physics throughout the year and reads widely on the subject. He started the course by submitting a research paper for review, quite an achievement. He's determined to understand and ask lots of questions, and he also enjoys helping other students and explaining ideas for them. Also at York, um, Finn has an insatiable desire to learn about physics. He always wants to understand everything, but finds it exciting when he realizes that he does not. It's often where he looks into the corners of physics that the course does not explore that Finn is at his best. He has a great history of asking excellent questions after lessons. Finally, also from York College, Hamza. Hamza is one of the most naturally gifted physics students we've encountered at York College. His natural ability, which would gain him an excellent grade, grade with little effort, is combined with a hard-working attitude and a desire to learn. Hamza's solutions to questions are, on occasion, as good or better than the mark scheme. So, in terms of the presentation element of, of this evening, that concludes it. And so well done to all of those in year two, 10 and in year 12 for all the fantastic achievements that we've just been able to outline. I'm really sorry that we can't have a round of applause here, 
I did actually think about having an audio, but that was probably be a bit too cheesy to, to run that. So I just want to say very well done to all of the award winners for all your fantastic efforts. And again, I'd like to thank the teachers and the parents who supported um, all of the winners tonight, um, because that's so important that that support is there. So well done to everyone. So now we're going to turn on to um, the presentation that we have as part of the awards um, uh, ceremony tonight. Um, and that's by um, Professor Tim Spiller, who's a colleague of mine at the University of York. Um, Tim is director of the York Center for Quantum Technologies and the EPSERC, EPSERC Quantum Communications Hub. He's going to tell you a lot more about that. It's basically part of a, a UK national quantum technologies program. This evening, he's going to be talking about exciting new quantum technologies, explaining the quantum physics concepts that underpin these and illustrating their quantum advantage before focusing on communication technologies, his own area, whose security is based upon quantum physics. So I'll hand over to, to Tim and I just remind everyone that there is the, um, the Q&A session. Uh, please, if you've got questions for Tim as we go through the talk, then please feel free to, um, to enter your questions there and we'll have a chance for Tim to, to give the answers at the end of those. So Tim, over to you. Thanks very much, Kieran. Okay, I hope everyone can see my slides and hear me. So it's a great pleasure to talk to you this evening. I was doing a little calculation and uh, it's almost exactly 40 years since I was uh, sitting my finals exams for, for my degree in physics. And it's very interesting to note that in that 40 years, uh, a great deal has happened in, in, in the subject area of quantum physics. And so if, if you know about the history of quantum physics, then in fact, it started its development uh, in the early part of the last century with the work of Einstein and Planck, and then uh, Max Born and Schrodinger and Heisenberg and Dirac and many more. So, so the quantum physics uh, that I was taught was all developed rather rather earlier than that. And the fundamental features of quantum physics that I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention in just a minute uh, were all known and understood. But there have been two major developments really in the last 40 years since, since I finished my physics degree. And, and, and those two things are firstly that, that in terms of, of being able to do experiments and manipulate quantum things, uh, 40 years ago, people could generally do experiments with collections of quantum things and, and manipulate them, them around. And, and over the last 40 years, what they've now been able to do is isolate individual quantum things and control them and manipulate them or, or a small number of them. So they can now in laboratories all over the world do fantastic experiments where they control quantum systems. So that's been one big jump forward. The other big jump is that we've learned that there are, uh, there are new technologies that can now be built on these very fundamental features of quantum physics. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about. So, so uh, if I can get my slides to move forward. So, so that, that's the purpose of my talk, to try and explain a little bit about these, these new technologies. So, so as I say, 40 odd years ago, when I was learning about quantum physics, the, the fundamental features uh, were, were all understood, but they were regarded as things that didn't impact everyday life. They were things you needed to understand to do experiments in laboratories somewhere, but they weren't something that could have any impact on, on people everywhere. But, but we now know that is all, all different. And, and in fact, there are whole new technologies now that are, are underpinned by these basic fundamental features of quantum physics, the things that make it different from, from everyday life and classical physics and, and if you like, your intuition. And so, so I've, I've, I've named these, these things with their proper words. So there's, there's three, really three features of quantum physics that, that, that make it, it counterintuitive. And, and, and those three things uh, I'll, I'll explain in a little more in just a minute. And, and they are the idea of superposition, the idea of entanglement, and the idea that you disturb things when you measure them. And so we'll see how these can underpin new technologies. And the really interesting thing about these new technologies is because they're built on something different, they have new abilities and, and they have the potential to, 
outperform uh, the familiar information technology that, that we all use today. And so the first of these that I'll mention is, is really computing. And so in quantum mechanics, things can be in superposition. And what that means is that they can be in many different states at the same time. And so if I wave my hands and say, suppose you had a computer chip that, that worked according to the laws of quantum mechanics, that computer could operate and do many, many calculations all at the same time in the same device. So it's like parallel processing, but all those parallel processes are all in the same physical quantum system. If, if you can do that, if you can do many, many calculations at the same time, then if you can manipulate all of those calculations together, you can do something uh, which is far more efficient than you can do with an ordinary computer. You can do calculations that are simply beyond any form of computer that we have uh, currently. And the applications that, that you, can, you can achieve, you can simulate and model things far better. You can do cryptanalysis, you can break codes, and I'll say a little more about that in a minute. You can, you can search more efficiently through databases. There are all sorts of algorithms, if you like, that you could run on a, on a quantum machine. What do you make these things from? Well, there's a whole lot of candidates being considered for this. There are certainly superconducting devices. Some of you may have heard, heard that, that both Google and IBM, uh, big computer companies or uh, are, are building machines based on superconductivity. People are trying to track tiny ions or atoms, individual uh, atoms, uh, and use those as, as the building blocks of a quantum computer. They're trying to use light and they're trying to use uh, semiconductors and, and little defects in diamond and also. So there's various, there's various candidates for what people are trying to build these machines from. But, but we know if we can build them, we can, we, can, uh, we can achieve computations that we can't do by ordinary means. So that's the idea of superposition, many states. The next thing I want to mention is the idea of, of entanglement. So entanglement is is where quantum systems such as atoms or quanta of light called photons can be intimately correlated in a way that's much, much stronger than any correlations you can imagine in the real world. So, so these, these quantum systems can be linked and this can be over a significant distance and they can have a correlation between them, which is actually stronger than, than any kind of uh, conventional correlation. Now, what that means is if you have a couple of these quantum particles that are, are correlated and you bounce one off some object that you wish to image or detect in some way, and then you bring these two, these two particles back together, you can actually learn something about the object with more detail or, or with more precision than you can learn if you use the same sorts of atoms or light in, in, in a conventional state. So you can... You can actually use, as I've mentioned, light atoms. You can also use tiny little uh, little vibrational nanomechanical devices or something if you want to detect fields such as, as gravity with, with greater precision. So there are various systems that you can use in an entangled state or other interesting uh, quantum states, which enable you to probe systems uh, more accurately. So one example of this you may well have heard of the detection of gravitational waves that was achieved at the LIGO detector a couple of years back. Well, they're now upgrading the LIGO detector to actually build, uh, build quantum uh, versions of it. So they're actually using squeezed light in, in the LIGO detector in order to improve the sensitivity of detecting gravitational waves. So that's one example of, of quantum sensing based on, on interesting quantum states of systems. The third uh, fundamental feature of quantum physics is the fact that when you measure quantum systems, you disturb them. So if, if you have a quantum system and, and you wish to learn about it, the only way you can do that is to come along and measure it. And, and when you do that, you will, you will disturb it. And, and that disturbance is fundamental in that it's built into quantum physics. It's not that the, the people who do the experiments will work out in a few years' time how to do the experiment better, and they will get around this fundamental disturbance. It's actually an intrinsic part of quantum physics. It's needed, in fact, to make quantum physics consistent with, with Einstein's theory of relativity. So it's not going to go away. 
and and it is very useful from the perspective of, of doing secure communications because if if people and they're always called alice who sends stuff to bob if alice sends quantum things to bob and someone has a cheeky look in the middle then by having that cheeky look they will inevitably disturb some of the stuff that alice is sending to bob which means that alice and bob can work out that someone is trying to eavesdrop so you can build a secure communication system on the basis that quantum things get disturbed when people when people measure them and and in terms of what we use to do quantum communications then it's light we use quantum signals of light to to to, to establish secure communications and this may be carried down optical fibers the kind of things that carry conventional high-speed communications now or it may be through free space and I'll, I'll mention a little about both of those options uh, later on so just to give you a bit of perspective, I mentioned that, that building a, a, a computer that works according to quantum laws uh, would enable better cryptanalysis. And in fact, it's, it's, it's a bit more serious than that. In fact, if someone builds a big quantum computer, which would have to be very much bigger than the, the one that Google, for example, is currently operating. If someone can build a very big one, then they could break most of the public key encryption that is currently used for our secure internet. Uh, communications and so on. So a, a significant problem is looming if, if quantum computers really are developed in the future at that, that kind of size. So, so that's one thing that's worrying, the fact that, that, that quantum computers will break a lot of the current cryptography that we're using. Uh, another serious consideration is, I just mentioned, quantum sensing and imaging will enable us to detect things you know, beyond what we can currently do. Uh, the good news is that despite both of those things which you might think of as problems, then there are new ways of doing secure communications based on Alice sending quantum things to Bob, which are immune to both of these, uh, both of these uh, potential attacks, if you like. So, so although we know problems are looming, we also know that solutions are looming, which is very good. And in addition to, to, to quantum-based uh, quantum-based uh, secure communications. It's also the case that, that these things that will be broken by a quantum computer, people are also trying to work out new forms of mathematical crypto that we hope are immune to, to being broken by a quantum computer. And so, so despite these worries, we think there is a, a nice way forward for secure communications in the future. So people are investing in this worldwide. In fact, many countries or the EU and so on have active programs and and in the UK we have a very substantial program and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that so we kind of have a bit of a tradition in the UK of dropping the ball when it comes of turning basic science into technology uh, so we have a long history in the UK of doing fantastic basic science but then very often that has turned into technology elsewhere in the world but over about the last 20 years successive UK governments have have realized that not only should we invest in the basic science, but we should also make sure that we turn that into working technology. And so uh, quite a number of subject areas, graphene included, for example, have, have benefited from investment trying to turn the basic science into, into technology. And, and our turn, if you like, in the quantum regime came in in 2013. So at the end of 2013, George Osborne, who was at the time the Chancellor of, of a coalition government found uh, 270 million pounds to start a new UK quantum technologies program. And, and that program started about a year later at the end of, of 2014. But, but this, this very large investment was, was to make sure that all of the basic quantum science that had been done uh, could actually turn into these, these potential technologies. So, so in the UK, very substantial investment was made in, in, in four great big projects. And I'm going to tell you a little more detail about just one of those uh, in a minute. But it, there was investment in, in these four large projects to actually build the technologies. There was invest, investment in training and, and skills and all sorts of other things. So there was a very substantial investment. And this was a, initially a five-year program. So it started late 2014 and finished towards the end of last year, and it's been renewed for another five years. So I'm gonna give you in, in a minute, a quick snapshot of what we've done in one of these technology hubs, hubs over the last five years. 
and then a quick forward look on what we're going to be doing in the next five years. And so, so these four hubs that were set up in the UK kind of covered all of the technologies that I've just uh, I've just tried to outline. So there was a there was a hub established uh, to work on on quantum computing, and that's led by the University of Oxford, but in general, these hubs have about 10 different universities involved, plus many, many companies. And I'll show you all of the, all of the folk involved in our hub in just a minute. But so each of these hubs is, is a big substantial spread out collaboration in, 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 uh, across the UK. And so the one led by the University of Oxford has been focusing on building uh, quantum computers uh, of, of various sorts. There's one led from the University of Glasgow that focuses on using light for, for quantum enhanced imaging of, of various things. Uh, there is uh, a hub led by the University of Birmingham and they use atoms to sense uh, gravity and so on to find uh, buried infrastructure and things like that. You can build gravitational based sensors that, that, can, that can pick out buried things uh, more accurately than you can do otherwise. And then there's a hub that's built on realizing secure communications. And, and that's the one that I lead. And so this is what we said we were going to do in, 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 in the last five years. And, and I'll tell you what we've achieved in, in just a minute. So, so our aim was to take basic science and to push it and, and to develop new technologies that can actually achieve secure quantum communications in a practical way. And the biggest thing that we do and I'm not going to explain in detail how it works, but I, I will talk just a little bit about it, is, is quantum key distribution. And so this is when Alice and Bob communicate with each other. And after they've managed to communicate quantumly, they can share a key between themselves. And that key can be used to encrypt subsequent uh, communications and protect them uh, against eavesdroppers. So, so in our hub in, in the last five years, we've got about... Uh, a tenth of that 270 million pounds. And going forward for the next five years, we've got a similar sized budget. And, and in fact, going forward into the next five years, uh, because UK industry is now beginning to also invest in, in these various quantum technologies, then, then in total, the estimated budget that, that includes all the industrial uh, contributions over the whole 10 year period it's going to be about one billion pounds. So it's a very substantial investment. So before I tell you just a little bit about what, what we have done and what we will be doing, I'll just say a little more about, about key distribution, which if you like is, is the, the integral building block that, that we, we use for, for, for quantum communications. And it's important to, to understand the distinction between sharing out of keys that can be used for encryption and then the use of the keys themselves, because the way it works is that is that Alice and Bob uh, can share out quantum systems uh, and measure them and establish a key and work out whether anyone else knows anything about that key. And that's the quantum part. So so Alice and Bob need to send quantum signals between each other to do that. And as I've said, this could be through optical fiber. It could be. Uh, through free space, and, and both of these are, 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 are options, and it depends on, on what length scales you're communicating over as to which of those uh, you do, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment. But, but the, the important thing to know is that once the communications have been done to establish the keys, you can then use these keys for whatever you like. You can use them to protect information, you can use them for transactions over the internet. So, the use of the keys once they've been distributed is not quantum. So you don't need the quantum technology to use them. You just need the quantum technology to establish the keys. And the important thing about keys, which are almost certainly true for, for all secure communications, is that they're a consumable. You use them once and then you should delete. Them. If you use them again, you'll probably violate the security and people will, will be able to, to subsequently decrypt your your encrypted information. So, so in addition to establishing quantum keys, when you want to top them up, that's when you also need the quantum technology. So, so that's key distribution. 
this, as I said, uh, I, I would, I promised you, I'd show you uh, a, a typical, so each of the four technology hubs that works in the different technology sectors will have a slide like this. It shows all the various university partners, but also it shows all of all of the companies that, that, that work with them. So of course, in the communications domain, British Telecom obviously handle a lot of the communications in the UK. And so, so they're a partner with us and, and we even have a working network with them there. So, so there's, there's BT who, if you like, are a service provider. There's all sorts of technology providers and so on, and people who will, will use, uh, use secure communications in the future. So, so that is, that is the, the slide showing all of our partners. As I say, it's a big distributed collaboration with, with about 10 universities and all of, these, uh, all of these industrial partners. So what have we done over the last five years? Just to show you that this, that this is, is, is real stuff now. It's not, just, it's not just hypothetical now. It really has moved out of the laboratory and into the real world. So one of the things we, we've developed, and we have a prototype that maybe doesn't quite look as, as sexy as this picture here, but it's, it's getting there. Uh, I said you can either communicate through free space or over uh, optical fibers. And over very short distances, it's clearly convenient uh, to communicate from a handheld device to some other device through free space. And so we've developed a very short range quantum key distribution system that can work between uh, a handheld device such as a phone and, and some device in the wall, some receiver. So the Bob unit would be a receiver built in the wall. And you can share quantum keys between your personal device and, and it might be your bank, it might be your employer, it might be your university or whatever. You, you can share keys between yourself uh, and, and all of these institutions. And then as I said, you can use these keys subsequently for various transactions. So short range, you can share quantum keys over free space. On a, on a longer distance, you can, you can share uh, keys down optical fibers. And, and here is the sort of test network that we've established in the UK. There's a network that now goes around Cambridge. There's a network that goes around Bristol and we're borrowing pieces of optical fiber to go between Cambridge and Bristol as well. There's also a network which is shown as a dotted line here that runs from Cambridge to British Telecom's uh, R&D center at, at Adastral Park near Ipswich. And we now have a working network there between, uh, between uh, our hub partner Cambridge and, and BT. And so we're using that to demonstrate applications of, of secure quantum communications along there. We've also built stuff on CHIP, University of Bristol, our partner there uh, showed the world's first chip to chip uh, quantum key distribution demonstration. They, they published that a couple of years ago, so that is now working. And, and we're now developing what we would call next generation technologies beyond uh, QKD. I've already mentioned we, we work very strongly with industry. We have, we have many industrial partners and they've been essential to, uh, to, to getting the work done over the last five years, but also now as part of the phase two, which is gonna run for the next five years, the government is now, so ISCF stands for Industrial Strategy Challenge Funding. And, and so the government, as well as funding people in universities to work on, on if you like, taking the, the basic science and turning it into working technology, they're now supporting businesses and universities as part of these projects as well to really make it commercializable technology. So, so there are many parallel projects that are now going forward in, 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 in phase two. Uh, to commercialize this, this new technology. So, so that's what we've achieved in the last five years. I'm not going to talk you through, through the intimate detail of all of this uh, in, the, in the next five years, but, but we're basically continuing to push our work forward, for example, on, on the, the fiber-based network that is going around the UK, and we're hoping to expand uh, that out. We're going to continue our work on the short-range handheld uh, QKD, but the one thing I, I would like to highlight that we're going to be doing over the next five years, which, which experiments are already underway uh, uh, elsewhere in the world and, and have shown that this is feasible, even if it sounds really rather difficult. You can do quantum key distribution between something on the ground and uh, a satellite that is orbiting around the Earth or possibly uh, some kind of high altitude uh, 
platform that that's that's uh, that's between satellite level and and the ground. And so that's one big thing that we're adding to 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 our agenda for the next five years. We want to do an experiment to demonstrate that we can exchange quantum keys between a small satellite about this sort of size and and a receiver on the ground. So. So we're pushing forward over the next five years with 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 very many new activities in, in quantum communications. And I'll, I'll just mention standards as well, because standards are something that always are needed for, for new technology. So when 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 new technologies emerge in order that the different pieces of new technology can can work with each other and in order to, to ensure that everything uh, fits together then standards are very important. So, so alongside developing the technology, it's very important to develop uh, the relevant standards. Okay, just to show you that this really is, is, is here now, then, okay, this is not quantum communication. This, this is a first small step in that in the, you can, as well as communicate quantumly, you can actually use quantum devices to generate random numbers, which are very important to underpin cryptography. So, so as of last month, uh, there's going to be a, a, a new version of, of, of uh, the uh, Galaxy smartphone that will actually contain a little quantum random number generator. So, so soon you will actually be able to buy quantum technology like this and carry it around in your pocket. So, so that's, that's how real it is now. So I'm going to close and just leave this slide up for a minute. If people are interested in learning a bit more about this, then, then there's a whole website for the whole UK national program, which, which includes all four of those hubs and various other activities. If you're interested in particular in quantum communications, you can read about our stuff. And if you're interested in reading about, uh, about all of the quantum technologies in, in a, in a, in a nice, uh, sort of low level article that was written for, for government, then, then, then you can read the Blackett Review on quantum technologies that was published just a couple of years ago. So, so with that, I'm gonna say thank you very much and uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, but we can put it back up if, if people want and, and we'll take questions. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, really fascinating stuff and, and obviously a lot going on in the UK. Um, so we have a couple of questions which are coming through. Um, the first one is that, um, so you sometimes hear about quantum teleportation. I mean, teleportation is quite a bit of a sci-fi thing. Um, can you tell me what that is and, and uh, would it ever realistically be able to do the kind of things that you see in sci-fi or is it something different? Uh, I, I think getting to to star trek level of teleportation is going to be very difficult but but i i can explain what it is uh, at, at a much more basic level and so the idea is if it, so i mentioned entanglement where where quantum particles that don't have to be next to each other can be intimately linked so if you share out quantum entanglement over a significant distance then you can use that shared entanglement as a resource and if you bring along some other quantum particle at one end and you combine it in a clever way with part of the entangled uh, pair over there, you have to send some information from one end to the other. But if you send that information from one end to the other, then the person who has the other half of the entangled pair can reconstruct the particle that you brought in over here. So. Teleportation is the, re if you like, de destruction and reconstruction of, of a quantum system from one place to another. It doesn't happen instantaneously because you have to send some information by conventional means from one end to the other in order for the, uh, the second person to reconstruct. So there's nothing instantaneous about it, although it's sometimes portrayed that way. It, it needs it needs a signal which is clearly governed by the speed of light. But, but you don't actually physically move the original quantum particle from over here to there. You deconstruct what, it, what quantum state it had here and you reconstruct it over there. So you, you, if it was the state of one atom, you, whatever that was, you could, you could take that state and you could, if you like, imprint it on a different atom over here. 
So, so it's actually moving the quantum state without actually physically moving the system that, that holds that quantum state. Now, one atom people have done, or one photon or something like that, uh, doing it for rather more substantial things, I think, is going to take a lot more work. So, so it, 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 it works at the individual quantum particle level, but, but I think doing it for something much bigger is going to be a lot harder. Okay, thanks. So, so beam me up, Scotty. Not quite yet. No, not quite, I'm afraid. Okay. So some other questions that are coming through. Um, so, I mean, you've said about the program that you're doing and, and the work here at York and with the partners and the industry. Um, how long do you think it'll be before quantum technologies become the norm? You, you, you finish with the picture of the Galaxy phone. Is that a gimmick or is that something that's really going to become more and more the norm? It's... I, I would say it's a bit of a gimmick at the minute. I mean, I've given some free advertising to Samsung and one of our partners, ID Quantic. So I might as well say it, it is a bit of a gimmick at the moment. And the one thing I, I would say is that I, I wouldn't, people shouldn't have the expectation that the current technology that they've got will be thrown away and they will replace it with quantum technology. I think what they will use is, is quantum technology for specific purposes. So they will augment the stuff that they've, they've got already. I don't think they'll replace it. So I don't think everyone, I think for what we do in, 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 in many aspects of our lives, an ordinary computer will keep doing exactly that stuff for us. But if we want to do some sophisticated calculations, we may access a quantum computer in the cloud to get the answers for that. Obviously we can use secure quantum communications to, to, to genuinely secure our communications in the future. And, and that may will, well become quite mainstream. But in terms of measuring and sensing things, you know, we only need to measure certain things more accurately. So I, I don't regard it as, as a likely replacement in the future. But, but in terms of random numbers and communications devices, they are appearing now. I mean, you can buy secure communications devices as well. They're rather expensive. I don't think individuals would buy them at the minute, but it, substantial institutions that are very security conscious uh, are, are doing this already. So, so I think the technology is just about here. Uh, how mainstream it becomes and how quickly, I think, depends on the commercialization routes and the markets. But, but it really is here now. It's not, it's not science fiction. Anymore. Great. Um, so another question from, from the board. Um, could information traveling through quantum entanglement ever be faster than the speed of light? No, <laughs> it is the short answer. Uh, it, no, I, it, pe people like to try and envisage ways that, that, that quantum mechanics might somehow outwit relativity. But, but that is the reason why I said the uncertainty that you have when you measure a quantum system and the randomness in the output is, is what rescues relativity. So although, uh, and, and the example of teleportation is a good one because uh, if you share out entanglement and then you do something at one end in order to teleport to the other end, the person at the other end doesn't have any useful information about what happened over here until they receive a signal. And that signal is limited by the speed of light. So although entanglement has these correlations built in that are stronger than any correlations we've got, you can't actually use those correlations to send information uh, instantaneously. You have to kind of wait for a light signal to get there to, to make it all happen. So, so I don't think there's any way you can transmit things faster than the speed of light. Okay, next question. Um... What are the dangers associated with this technology and, and how can you kind of contemplate exploring those? So we all know that there's very good sides to some physics research, but sometimes there can be unintended consequences or darker sides. So what do you see as being you know, the dangers associated with quantum technologies? Well, I, I think, it, as you say, there are always downsides. I mean, one that's clearly been identified already is that you can use a, a big quantum computer when that exists to break a lot of the current encryption that, that people are using. And so, so that, well, that again is a double-edged sword. It, you know, if, if the people using the encryption are, are the bad guys, then you would say, well, that's a good thing to be able to break their encryption. On the other hand, if, if it's the good guys who are having their encryption broken by the bad guys. So, so 
there's always there's always a scenario that you have to describe but certainly if you like quantum computers have some level of threat but of course there's all sorts of uh, upsides to to being able to to solve new problems and so but i think the 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 threat to encryption is one thing that's been identified and then uh you say okay well quantum communications can come or perhaps in combination with new mathematical crypto can come to the rescue but yet again if you have absolute guarantee of end-to-end -end security then uh, if if it's bad guys who are, are communicating uh to each other then you'd say well that's a bad thing if it's if it's you communicating to your bank you'll say it's a good thing so so there's always a good side and a bad side to absolutely secure communications. And I think, I think that's something that has to be weighed up. And so, so it may well be that, that, you know, secure communications will always go through certain people call them trusted nodes where the service provider could in principle access information. And so that might be a suitable uh, balancing point. But, but I, I, I think in terms of, of producing new forms of weapons in the in the in the way that early quantum physics led to the atomic bomb, I, I don't think people are, are using quantum technologies to come up with 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 new designs for 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 even nastier weapons at the minute. So I don't see that kind of threat emerging. I think it's more to do with information, and so it, information in terms of whether that's a a, a good or a bad thing is is I think the, the main thing to weigh up. And, and, and so who do you think is the kind of world leader? And maybe that's not, there isn't a single world leader, but for example, you hear about how um, China has had success in having quantum um, communications to satellites, to a ground station. And does that, would you say China is ahead of the game or is it, is it more the UK or, or other places? Uh, I, I, there are activities all over the world that I would say at the minute, uh, uh, are pretty comparable. I, I, I think there's been a bit of a race and, and I think the Chinese are probably winning in terms of who spent the most money. I think the Chinese have probably invested the most. It's certainly true that they've done a, a, a satellite to ground experimental demonstration. It wasn't really what I would call working technology at the minute. And I don't think what we will do in the next five years will be working technology either. It will be proof of principle demonstration. I think it's going to take a lot more work to get that to, uh, to uh, being a, a, a working technology at, at a suitable data rate. So, so the Chinese have certainly done the first experiment. That's true. The US has invested very heavily, and I think in quantum computing at the minute, Google and IBM are arguing about which of them has, has the most advanced quantum computers. So, so I think I think there are there are various uh, there are various companies around the world that are pushing on on quantum computing. I think the UK has a very strong background in 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 the fundamental science, and the one thing that I, I think was noticeable worldwide when we set up the UK program was the level of coordination that we've got between, uh, between the fundamental science researchers, the academics and universities and the companies. And so we're certainly not, you know, I said over 10 years, we may be spending a billion pounds. Well, I don't think that's very substantial compared to what the, the US is spending or China's spending. It's probably comparable with, with spend across Europe. But, but I think the, the thing that, that, that made uh, the rest of the world take note of the UK program was the level of coordination we had. So I think although we're not spending the most money, I think we're spending it wisely. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just take maybe one or two more questions. One is the fact that, of course, encryption of data is a, is a, is a very live political topic as well as a scientific topic. Uh, and, and quantum comms, I guess, might introduce um, encryption which which might be used for criminal purposes and um, to what degree is that going to be a challenge if, if you've got commercialized devices that simply fundamentally can't be intercepted i think i alluded to this already i think i think the only way to get around having a system where there is some compromise is to have guaranteed security between certain points so people can't go in and have a a, a cheeky look at what's being communicated where you don't want them to look but then you have a whole network of nodes where the information could be accessed 
And so the way you establish the network is that is that you don't have absolute end-to-end -end security between any two individuals. If you offer that, then you will have guaranteed security from the good perspective, but you will also offer it to, to anyone who wishes to abuse that. So, so I think the, the way to build a system would be to, to have secure links where you wish them to be secure, but then you have what people call trusted nodes where in principle the information could be accessed uh, subject to a suitable warrant or whatever presented okay. to the service provider. I think that's the best compromise. If, if, you, if you think the compromise is the way to go, then I think that's probably the way to do it. Okay, thanks, Tim. I've got one last question, actually, that I do want to ask you, which is that you, you, you've introduced it by talking about the quantum mechanics that you learned at your university career. And obviously, now we're moving on and there's lots more um, technologies emerging from that. Um, when do you think quantum technologies is going to be on the GCSE or A-level syllabus? Uh, it's already on the A-level syllabus in, in, in a limited sense. In, uh, uh, as part of it was on one, one, on one of my slides, but I didn't highlight it. As part of uh, the last five years effort, uh, on behalf of actually the whole UK program, so not just quantum communications, it was for all the quantum technologies, our hub took the lead in establishing what, what we call the quantum ambassadors program. So, so this is, has produced material and also trains up people who can go into schools and present it uh, specifically uh, as, as a kind of uh, targeted piece in, in, in the A-level syllabus. And, and that's been rolled out to, to, as a trial to, to, I think, over 100 schools in, in the UK. So it is already getting there. In phase two, we're hoping to do that bigger and better. And then as a consequence, also pull out something that could be then used uh, at the GCSE level, so final year GCSE. So it's in progress. It is happening, but it's not nationwide. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Tim. Um, really interesting talk. Um, and, and thank you for answering the questions from the audience. Um, I think there's a lot more um, to happen over the forthcoming years in quantum technology. So it's an area we've got to keep an eye on. Um, so let me at this stage oh, bring, bring the um, event to a, a close. Um, so as well as thanking Tim, I'd also like to thank um, the Ogden Trust and in particular Claire for joining us this evening. I'd also like to thank all the teachers and parents supporting the students. Um, supporting the students is, is there all the time and it's important all the time, but it's especially um, during the pandemic, it's a very difficult time. And so thank you again um, for all the teachers and parents in being able to support students during lockdown. But most importantly, um, a really well done to all of the award winners tonight. Um, it's fantastic to see um, all the stuff that you're doing and it's inspiring to see such talent and potential for the future. So thank you and, and, and well done with the rest of your studies and, and, and best wishes for the future.